Okay, so here we are with our final lesson in this very short unit on thermodynamics. But today we're talking about the second law. And um, previously we've talked about uh, the first law. And today we're going to concern ourselves um, with something a little bit different. So we're going to start our discussion by looking at heat engines. And simply put, a heat engine is, is a device that takes in the internal energy of a system and turns it into usable work. Okay, so um, we've got this heat engine right here, and of course there's a hot reservoir from which heat flows into the engine. And then of course there's a cold reservoir to which um, heat is expelled um, from the engine, and of course from this work is completed. And for any heat engine we can calculate the amount of work that's done using this little formula. The work is simply the difference between the heat that's taken in and the heat that's given off. Okay. So when we move forward we can talk about the efficiency of any heat engine. Okay, And so re remember that efficiency is basically just a ratio of the useful energy that we get out of the engine divided by the energy that we put into the into the system. And so when we're talking about heat engines, of course, the energy that flows in is this heat from the hot reservoir, and the work that we get out is simply W. And with our little expression on um, just above, we can replace W with QH minus QC. And we can simplify this one step further, and we have a couple now expressions for um, the efficiency of one of these engines. Okay. With this kind of a theory, there's there's no real way that any heat engine can operate at 100% efficiency. In that, there's no way that we can turn all of the heat that's coming in into work. And that statement is kind of like, it's kind of one way of looking at the second law of thermodynamics. Before we get to that, though, let's do a quick example using some of these concepts. A heat engine has an efficiency of 24%. It performs... 1,250 joules of work. Find the heat that's absorbed from the hot reservoir and the heat that's given off to the cold reservoir. Okay, so again, this is where we begin, and we've got efficiency is equal to work over QH, and we know how much work is done, we know what the efficiency is, so this is simply plug our numbers in, rearrange, and solve. And we have um, 5,208 0.3 joules of heat energy. All right, now moving on, we've got, oh, ignore this, this should be 5.2, not 5.3. But if we want to find QC, which is the heat that's given off to the cold reservoir, then we'll just use this, because again, we have the work, and we've just calculated QH, and so we can go in here and solve for QC. And we can do this right here. Then we find that QC is, of course, 3,958.3 joules. We rounded off 4.0 times 10 to the 3 joules. Okay, so what is the second law of thermodynamics, then? Because we kind of alluded to something a little bit earlier. The second law is written in many different ways. There's many different people that have approached the second law of thermodynamics from their point of view. And this is the one that we're going to use here um, in this course, and that's that heat flows spontaneously from a substance at a higher temperature to a substance at a lower temperature, and does not flow spontaneously in the reverse, which means that if you want heat to go from um, a low temperature to a high temperature, then you need to drive it with some energy added to the system, because it won't do that by itself. Okay, so that's our statement of the second law of thermodynamics. And that has very important, um, of course we saw that with the heat engine, that has very important um, consequences, saying that heat will flow from that hot reservoir to the, to the uh, heat engine, and then of course from the engine to the cold reservoir. And it'll do that spontaneously. So we can get work out. So here's um, just a small extension um, is power. Whenever we talk about work, of course the rate that work is done is power. So we can talk about the rate at which heat is absorbed 
by the heat engine, and that would be QH over T. We can talk about the rate of heat expulsion, or the rate that heat is given off by the heat engine, and that's QC over T, and basically we know, very familiar, that power is of course equal to the work that's done divided by the time. Okay, so one particular engine has a power output of 5,000 watts and an efficiency of 25%. If the engine gives off or sheds 8,000 joules of heat every single cycle, find the heat absorbed each cycle and the time each cycle takes. So here's what we know. We know the power, we know the efficiency, and we know what QC is because this is 8,000 joules. Of course, this is if the engine sheds this much heat, that's how much it's giving off. So right away, we can use one of our efficiency formulas because we have QC, we have efficiency, we can find QH. And we make a substitution, we rearrange, and we solve, and we find that QH is equal to 10,667 joules, rounding to significant figures, 1.1 times 10 to the 4th. The time, then, we can calculate from this power expression. Once I know QC and QH, I can find the work that the engine does. And I can simply sub in here. I've rearranged power down below, time up, up here by itself. And I find that the time that each cycle takes is 0 0.53 seconds. All right. So we'll talk about one very special type of engine, which is the Carnot engine. And um, the issue of efficiency has always been an important issue. It still continues to be an important issue in, in today's world. Ideally, of course, we would like to get as much work out of an engine as possible. So, you know, how is it, how is it that we can extract the most amount of work out of a given amount of fuel? So how close to 100%? can we get? And of course this question was first asked and, and really solved theoretically in 1820, which is a long time ago, by Carnot. And he invented a theoretical engine known as the Carnot engine, and it operates at the maximum possible efficiency of any engine. Okay, now it's a theoretical engine, you need to understand that it's theoretical. But he believed, basically his, his, the theory on which he based his, the development of this engine was that he believed that there's some absolute low temperature, an absolute zero, maybe we'll call it, temperature, where when a liquid was cooled to that temperature, we give up all of its heat energy. Now that should be pretty familiar because we know that absolute zero is a temperature um, that's out there. It's, um, of course, the lowest temperature that we can possibly have at zero Kelvin. And at that point, uh, liquid or um, any substance really that's sitting at absolute zero has given up all of its heat energy. And so any given engine then that takes in heat at T and then gives up half of its heat, so makes it halfway to absolute zero, if absolute zero is, of course, zero and temperature is T, that's, that would be 50% efficient. And so say some engine takes in heat at T and makes it all the way down to like 0 0.9 T, that would be 90% efficient. So in this way, the closer and closer we can get to that absolute zero, the, most, the more efficient our engine is going to be. And so he um, hypothesized this cycle right here, which is called the Carnot cycle. And we go from A to B, B to C, C to D, and then back to A. It's a reversible process where the section, this section right here, A to B, is an isothermal expansion. So it's expanding. And this right here, this line, would be an isotherm. So every single point along here would be the same temperature. And at this point, heat would flow in to the engine. This section from B to C is an adiabatic expansion which means that from here to here, of course, the volume changes, it's expanding, the pressure would change, the temperature would change, but adiabatic, of course, means no heat flows out of the engine during this stage. 
C to D is an isothermal compression of the liquid, which means that as we go from here to here, all of these points have the same temperature, and of course, heat flows out of the system at this point. And then the last section, D to A, is an adiabatic compression, which means again, the fluid compresses, but no heat is lost during this time. And using this, using this cycle, we maximize the amount of work that's done um, by this engine and therefore maximize the efficiency of the engine. One thing that we have to know whenever we're working with any problems with the Carnot engine or um, with any of these um, PV diagrams where we have the Carnot cycle, we must use temperatures that are in Kelvin. Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple of um, equations here. So this is the efficiency of a Carnot engine. The derivation of this is not really important, but when we talk about these temperatures, they have to be measured in Kelvin. Also for a Carnot engine, we have a relationship between the heat that's shed over the temperature of the cold reservoir and the heat that's taken in over the temperature of the hot reservoir. We would need to use Kelvin for these as well. So let's look at um, uh, example number three, in where we say the efficiency of a Carnot engine is 30 to, uh, 30%. The engine absorbs 800 joules of heat per cycle from a hot reservoir at 500 Kelvin. And so we want to determine the heat that's given off per cycle and the temperature of the cold reservoir. So to begin, we know a few things, and here's what they are. We know the temperature of this hot reservoir, we know the heat that's um, basically um, that, that comes in from the hot reservoir, and we know the efficiency. And so what we can say right away is we can flip to our um, formula for Carnot efficiency, and we can simply say 0 0.3 equals 1 minus Tc over 500. We've made our substitutions, we rearrange, and we solve, and we see, okay, the temperature of the cold reservoir is 350 Kelvin. So that's part A done. Part B, we're going to use this proportion because what we want to know is the heat that's expelled, which is QC. And of course, we can rearrange, substitute, and solve. And 560 joules of the 800 is then given off to the cold reservoir. Um, here, we're going to talk about our final concept in this in this lesson today, which is the concept of entropy. And I'm almost certain that you've probably heard of entropy from some discussion in your chemistry class. Basically, entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. And this has a lot to do with phases and, and states, and changes of state. Um, entropy is a function of state. Only the state of the system at the present time determines the entropy of the system. It doesn't matter how the system got there. But basically, if it's a liquid now, it's got a certain amount of entropy. And if it's, got a, if it's a solid now, it's got a certain amount of entropy, right? So only the state of the system now matters when you determine entropy. In general, when heat is added to a system, the entropy increases. So the system becomes more disordered. So think of a solid. A solid is relatively ordered system. When we add heat to it, that solid can become a liquid. And of course, liquids have a more disordered um, state than solids do. When heat is taken away, entropy decreases, so the system becomes less disordered. This is a relationship that looks at the, the change in entropy as a function of the heat in or out and the temperature of the reservoir in Kelvin. This little r refers to the fact that um, basically cycles that are like the Carnot cycle um, will have a change in entropy that doesn't affect the universe. So this, this would kind of say, okay, this is for reversible cycles. And we're going to talk about what we can do here with this equation. Calculate the change in entropy resulting from the melting of a 0 0.125 kilogram block of ice, 0 degrees Celsius. And so what we need to know, if we want to look at the change in entropy, is that we need to know, okay, well, how much heat um, 
is involved in this. And what we can say right away is that, oh, well, the heat that's involved in melting this ice is simply the mass of the ice times its latent heat of fusion. And latent heat of fusion is a constant, which we can look up um, or would be provided to us. And we can simply substitute now and solve. And, of course, this is 152 joules per Kelvin. Okay, on to our final example. A hot reservoir at 576 Kelvin transfers 1,050 joules of heat irreversibly to a cold reservoir at 305 Kelvin. Find the change in entropy of the universe. So we know with reversible processes, right, where heat is added to a system and then heat is taken away to a system, and they're completely reversible, the change in entropy, of course, of that is zero, right? So the universe does not change in entropy. It becomes more disordered, and then we reverse the process and it becomes less disordered. And then we reverse the process and it becomes more disordered, and it goes back and forth. So overall, the entropy of the universe doesn't change. But when a process is carried out irreversibly, the entropy of the universe does change. We're going to see how to do that now. So we want to know this delta S. We know TH, we know TC, and we know the amount of heat that flows. And so let's figure out the amount of heat that flows um, basically from the hot reservoir. And we say 1,050 over 576. And of course, this is heat that's leaving the system because it's flowing from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir. And we get minus 1.82 joules per Kelvin. You notice that we have to impose this negative sign because heat is flowing out of the hot reservoir and into the cold reservoir. Now we look at the change in entropy of the cold reservoir. Well, here, 1,050 joules of heat enter the cold reservoir. Here's the temperature. And here's what we get. And so our total change in entropy, delta H plus delta, sorry, delta SH plus delta SC, is equal to 1.62 joules per, per Kelvin. And of course, this makes sense. We see an increase in entropy, so an increase in the disorder of the system. We're warming up this cold reservoir. And that's basically entropy in a nutshell. And that concludes our unit on, our very brief unit on thermodynamics.